Twenty dollars, what's it look up to it? This is the DSO 138 uh, oscilloscope kit, which uh, is uh, an STM32 based uh, oscilloscope kit, which you can buy for $23.50 off of Banggood.com. And this was uh, kindly or unkindly donated by a viewer in order to see uh, how much oscilloscope you can get for $23.50, including shipping from China. And uh, the short answer is uh, actually a fairly good amount of stuff. The scope, I believe, is specified for a 200 kilohertz analog bandwidth, which uh, isn't particularly spectacular, but uh, I mean, to be kind to it, you might view this thing as more of a graphing multimeter than uh, an oscilloscope, although it's probably going to be a horribly inaccurate <laughs> graphing multimeter, but anyway. You do get a fair amount of stuff for your money. You get a, a board which is tin plated. It seems to be a fairly high quality, nice and shiny, no gunk. And in this version, there's another version too, but in this version, they've gone through the effort of soldering about 10 or 12 SMD parts for you, including the micro microcontroller and what I'm presuming to be an op amp, which is a pretty nice touch. You also get uh, a little tiny color LCD with it, which I'm very much hoping isn't cracked and ruined, because this is basically the package as it arrived. It was wrapped in a couple of rounds of really thin foamy stuff, which really wasn't confidence instilling. And there's not a trace of anti-static stuff going on, so... That guy there might not have had too nice a life thus far, sitting on a large EMI-friendly board with virtually no terminating component installed. Beyond that, you do get a surprisingly nice feeling a little clampy probe thing with it, which uh, I mean, this thing is much higher quality than I would expect. It's even got a gold-plated BNC in there. So, I'm not expecting it to actually be a proper coax, but it's going to do for 200 kilohertz sign. Good enough. And uh, these manuals you get are color printed and uh, not not per super high quality paper, but uh, they seem to be of relatively high quality with uh, okay quality instructions for how to actually assemble this thing. I'll go through those in a bit more detail, but uh, at a glance they seem to be well enough. They should be understandable. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you get this assorted bag of things which are supposed to go onto the board. In an order like that, so assembly might be a bit finicky because you don't even have your resistors sorted or marked. You can have to look at the tiny little 0.1 watt or something like that. <laughs> markings on them, which is going to be a bit of a bother. Anyway, I'm just going to go right ahead and assemble this thing so that we can go get into the actual performance of it. And before we get too carried away, here's a quick look at the specifications for this thing. It's basically one mega sample per second or 200 kilohertz analog bandwidth. Eh, doesn't quite add up. I would not call one mega sample per second to be of uh, 200 kilohertz quality, I'd say that's about 100 kilohertz. But it might do a decent enough job. 10 millivolts per division to 5 volts per division. That's not particularly impressive, but uh, I mean, it's it might be if it actually performs to any rate at uh, 10 millivolts per division. It's going to be usable enough for you know, in a starting hobbyist or something. Although, 12 bits of resolution, eh, 
10 millivolts per division, 12 bits. Eh, yeah, that, that, that's vastly inflated. The, I checked the data sheet and the processor does have a 12 bit ADC, but the actual performance you're going to get out of it is going to be nowhere near 12 bits, and especially not at when it's pushing along a large graphical UI and doing all kinds of stuff too. So I don't think this is going to perform better than a normal 8 bit uh, bench escape, to be brutally honest. 1024 points, record length, nothing. Uh, 500 seconds per division is to five, 10 microseconds per division time base. Okay, nothing to really note there. Trigger mode is also a normal single, as you'd expect. Trigger position range 50%. Now, does that only mean that it can only trigger at the middle of a waveform? Hmm, I'll have to find that out. 9 volt DC power supply, 8 to 12 volts, 120 milliamps. Consumption and all this from our friends at JYT Tech Limited with a very proper forum for tech support. And here's what the finished product is supposed to look like. And uh, like you so many people on the internet, it's going to be very clear about when it's triggered. Beyond that, it looks uh, relatively useful. The UI uh, prints on the circuit board is relatively logical and you yeah, you, 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 I can see that UI working well enough for a button-based scope, although yeah, you, you'd probably want to mount this in some kind of box or something so, you'll, yeah, so that you, you're not fiddling around here when you're trying to measure some higher voltage signal because things, this thing supposedly does a, a 50 volts a, a peak or 100 volts peak to peak without exploding so you could have a fair amount of voltage right here around the B and C Although I'm not entirely certain as to how safe it would be to actually feed that high voltage into this thing. But here are the assembly instructions, which uh, seem to be quite straightforward. They tell you where to mount, which components, give you some newbie tips on soldering. And that's about it. They also provide you with a bit of basic troubleshooting if you, your finished product doesn't quite work. I'm just generally impressed by these, they seem to be of OK quality. But the probe, as you might expect, is a venerable antenna, because this is what you get with you just hook uh, one of my normal cheap Chinese, but a bit more proper probes, up to the color output of my analog scope. And if we just take one of these and put them there, uh, we get uh, enough interference entering the probe to actually upset the quality of the 8-bit signal on that pin. It doesn't matter which uh, probe we trigger on, we still get noise because I've got a light fixture sitting there. If I just flick that off, everything's hunky-dory, so not the highest fidelity probe, but it'll probably do for really low frequency stuff and really high voltage stuff, although it is a times one probe, so you yeah, I would not be feel comfortable putting a lot of voltage into this, nor the rest of the scope for that matter. And here are the parts you get to make yourself. So we've got a crystal, a bit of six electrolytic caps, a large choke, a couple of small, uh, I think they're adjustable chokes, a lot of 100 nano caps, a few minor ceramics, four TO92s, a couple of diodes, and a lot of through hole resistors and a couple of through hole chokes, I believe, and yes, yeah, switches, headers. I'm not entirely certain what these guys are for, might be to made for display, and a really cheap looking BNC. Although it's gold plated, so got to give it that. Anyway, on to the challenge. Here's a quick look at the display, it seems to be. Completely parallel and stupid, nothing on the back side going on at all. Supposedly colour, I'm not certain of the res resolution, might be 320 by 240 probably. I'll have to find out. Seems relatively solid though. Now, I have a, a fair amount of experience assembling electronic devices. 
and uh, since this kit is uh, quite obviously aimed towards uh, newcomers probably mainly looking for their first oscilloscope I figured I'd uh, give myself a bit of a disadvantage so uh, I had a few drinks prior to assembling this thing and when I woke up this morning I found this note uh, sitting on my workbench which I'm assuming to mean that it took about one and a half hours to mount the scope and that is uh, no doubt due to these uh, very easy to follow instructions which uh, uh, do a very good job actually guiding you through it I had no problems even in my impaired state to follow them and you get these nice little tick boxes which are very clear and easy to remember to just blot something in once you uh, put everything together. In the end though, I did end up with a mounted board. Uh, my kit included uh, all the components, I haven't noticed anything missing and uh, I can indeed attest that this works. There are a couple of things which uh, are a bit trick about this board though. Uh, the first one was that I managed to absolutely melt the BNC the plastic in it is not solar resistant at all and it takes quite a bit of heat to get these uh, very thick tabs of air to actually heat up enough for the uh, solder to grab them properly so when I have this mounted I noted that the center pin was about uh, 2 millimeters uh, off center but uh, I managed to straighten that out good enough I don't think it ever quite fit a BNC connector properly, to be honest. And uh, I'd also forgotten, when first testing this thing, to short uh, this little jumper here, which uh, it does say uh, in the instructions to do, but I, uh, for whatever reason there might be, forgot to do it. And uh, the scope worked fine, it seemed, but I think it had a bit of an uh, excessive DC offset. And I haven't been able to really figure out what uh, that jumper does, and not that I have looked very hard. But the DC offset got a bit better once I shorted it. There's also uh, another jumper down there, which uh, you're supposed to short after checking that the 3.3 volt regulation on the board works, which uh, is probably this regulator here. And this, this just jumpers power to onto the processor so that you have a chance to check that you don't have, you know, 12 volts going into your processor and frying everything and ruining, and ruining all your hard work. They don't tell you how to measure it though, they just tell you to check uh, the test point here, test point 22. But they don't tell you where to reference it, but that's obviously to ground, which you can get from the DC plug somewhere around there. Or just a pin or a regulator. All in all, the board was very easy to solder, save for the BNC, the board was very clean, there was no excess oxidation, no nothing. I I'm honestly impressed by the quality of the board, it I haven't noticed any pads falling off or anything like that, all hills are through plated, so a big thumbs up to yeah, whatever the company name is called for producing a proper board. And here is the display board. You have to solder the jumper onto it yourself and I believe these two are just there as well as these two pin headers to hold everything in place it just goes in like so and it sits there quite sturdily oh, one thing I'm very unimpressed with though is uh, these uh, uh, clacky ticky switches, these do not feel as if they're of a very high quality and I would suspect these to fail mm, quite uh, quickly compared to the rest of the tactile switches are of uh, very okay quality they feel exactly as you would uh, desire such a switch to feel like but yeah these are probably best to <laughs> be replaced by something else or just using off-board switches if you're going to do a lot of range switching these these two change the input voltage range and this one changes the probe coupling anyway let's peel this techie thing off revealing a matte LCD I thought it was going to be shiny and apply some power I've got 
I've made 9 volts DC with this plug. And it does boot up. Jitech.com. And there we go, we've got a little trace. Now, the first time I paired this up, uh, it had that DC offset error, which I fixed. And it does tell you in the manual how to address the DC offset uh, calibration, but I haven't, for the life of me, managed to turn it uh, incorrect again. Now, I can't really seem to enter the serial volt calibration mode, for whatever reason. So I can't, can't show you how to actually do that. Not certain if that's a bug or a feature. Anyway, as far as the capability of this thing, you're basically looking at everything right now. Uh, we've got a reset button down there. An OK button, which just does run stop and random stuff around. A plus and minus button, which adjusts your parameter. And a select button, which chooses which parameter you want to use. And you've just got some real basic ones. You've got time base, trigger mode, auto, normal, single, shot, uh, up slope, down slope, and you've got to... Uh, this took a long time for me to figure out. So you got your trigger level here, which uh, uh, for the key night it's obvious that this purple value represents that, but uh, I took a long time to figure that out since I had the DC offset issue. So this value didn't at all seem to coincide with the trigger setting. But uh, the purple value is your trigger level. And we'll get to quite a bit more depth about the trigger in, in a minute. You also have uh, this uh, scroll bar which uh, scrolls through uh, the, the horizontal length of your waveform. And that's one of my biggest gripes with this scope. You cannot zoom out. You cannot get the entire length of captured data in one screen. And look at the rate this thing moves. I'm holding the button and it doesn't go faster if you tap it. So it's scrolling, 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 scrolling. And there we go, at the end. And now we've just got to get back. <coughs> There's also no clear marker as to where the center of that is, so it gets a bit confusing. Again, more on that later when we get to the triggering issues. And over here on the left, you just have your DC offset adjustment. Which uh, works well enough, it just moves the trace up and down. So, I've got a signal coming in for a BNC around here. Oh, there we go. We've got a really nice looking trace. And there should be a 1 kilohertz signal of uh, some unknown amplitude and a relatively hidden away feature you've got in the scope is that it's actually got some measurement capability. If you select the time base and hold the OK button for two seconds, you pause the updating and you get that. So you can get your frequency, your cycle length, your what I'm assuming to be your half cycle length, uh, your duty cycle, your maximum voltage, minimum voltage, voltage, average voltage, peak to peak voltage and RMS voltage. Which is all pretty nice, although I've, this RMS feature seems to be very inaccurate. It doesn't agree with any of my meters nor my scope. You also get this nice little LED down there, which uh, flashes whenever the scope triggers, which uh, is a pretty useful feature. I, I like having it, although it uh, seems to be a bit random at times. And uh, it uh, very well d uh, demonstrates another one of the triggering issues with its scope, which is that it seems to have a quite long trigger hold off. Uh, it uh, takes quite some time uh, to trigger again once it's triggered, which uh, can cause some. It can work to your advantage, it can work to your disadvantage, but it can produce some weird results if you're measuring weird signals. But now let's get into the weird triggering issues of this kit. Uh, th these two scopes, this is a Rigol DS1052E, uh, are set up uh, 
identically they set the trigger at minus 0.52 volts they're at 100 microseconds per division and uh, they are triggering just normally uh, as you would expect any scope to trigger but uh, if we zoom in on the Rigol we can zoom in just fine and we get our waveform zoomed in too and it looks basically perfect as you would expect a waveform to look. I'll leave it that 10 microseconds per division which is the fastest time base that the DSO-138 uh, uh, can manage. And let's do the same thing to the DSO-138. 50 microseconds, 20 microseconds, 10 microseconds and it looks pretty much the same. But notice how the DSO-138 is jittering around. And uh, this confused me greatly for quite a bit of time because uh, you would expect this issue to be caused by a trigger that's uh, not in the center of the screen. If we were to zoom the Rigel way to either of the edges, you know, it, it would probably be jittering a bit too, since the waveform isn't 100% perfectly stable. But uh, the DSU 138 is. I mean, you would expect the trigger to be in the middle of the screen, but there is no marker. In fact, there is no way for you to actually know where your trigger position is on the horizontal. Uh, you know, you've got it right there in the vertical, but where? In the vert where in the horizontal is it triggering? Because you've got, as remember, a huge amount of horizontal data that's actually being captured. You can scroll all the way through it. You've got uh, many uh, wave cycles going there, and I can tell you that they are all jittery. And that's because in the two facet time bases on this scope, it doesn't seem to be really triggering at all. It seems to be in some kind of weird uh, free-running mode. And uh, I am going to prove that. Okay, so what I've done now is I've set my computer up to generate an arbitrary waveform of five positive going cycles at 10 kilohertz and one negative going cycle and we're triggering off a single negative going cycle. And I can feed this waveform a few times, and everything's just fine. But uh, watch what happens when we zoom in. At 100 microseconds, everything's fine. At 50 microseconds, everything's fine. And at this stage, you would expect this center line here, when this marker is in the center, to be the triggering point. But watch what happens when we go to 20 microseconds the waveform basically disappears, it's off somewhere way to the right and if, if you were to scroll all the way to the right you still would not be able to see this entire waveform and if we go yet one more step in it disappears altogether it doesn't matter how many times I feed it in there it isn't going to ever show up and again if you scroll both ways you're not going to find anything on this entire screen whereas on the Rigel you can see we're triggering perfectly but there is a negative going signal coming there for you to trigger on and I've basically just concluded that uh, there seems to be no working triggering mechanism for the two fastest time bases which isn't really a problem if you're only measuring you know, continuous repetitive signals like a pure sine wave or a pure square wave or anything like that. But if you've got anything which is kind of intermittent or you want to capture it, you you are just out of luck. Because I've spent a few hours playing with this and I, I, I have not by any means managed to get it to actually trigger on anything beyond a rep repeating wave in the two fastest time bases. The fact that the fastest time base you get is uh, 10 microseconds per division also 
present a bit of an issue when compared to the scopes of advertised analog bandwidth of 200 kilohertz, because as you may be able to tell, uh, we're feeding a 110 kilohertz signal into it right now, and uh, the horizontal resolution of this uh, signal is already quite poor. Uh, not only in the display, but you can also see the aliasing at the tops of the uh, trays there. So, yeah, judging from this, I would not uh, uh, honestly call this a 200 kilohertz scope because performance at uh, such a high frequency is going to be abysmal, and at a frequency at a trace that is uh, twice as crowded as this one you're viewing right now, it, it's not going to be very useful at all. Moving down to lower frequencies, though, the performance uh, is uh, a lot improved. When we can get out of the 20 and 10 microsecond uh, horizontal time basis, we do actually seem to have an unmarked uh, trigger right in the middle of it. And uh, it still has this weird horizontal, I want to say trigger jitter, but I'm not entirely certain as to what it is, uh, no matter the frequency and no matter the time base. But uh, moving down to the frequencies, this, this being 10 kHz and moving down to 1 kHz, it certainly performs a lot better than it does at uh, frequencies above 10 kHz. So for doing something basic like uh, tracing a signal through, through an audio amp or something, I mean, using a 1 kHz test signal, this could probably do just fine. As for the accuracy of the parameter measurements, they seem to be close enough to what you'd expect. Uh, this is an oscilloscope, not a multimeter. And uh, yeah, but they're probably a few percent out. I mean, the RMS, the true RMS value we're measuring is 5.998 and it's set at 5.63. But yeah, I'd say this is good enough for 2350, it certainly is. It seems to be relatively consistent across its uh, frequency range, as long as we don't uh, thread too high into the frequency because I think it's okay up to 10 kilohertz but once you get to the stage where you uh, enter uh, exit the useful range of the display uh, you can see that it's gone entirely weird and this is another quite major issue with this scope uh, when it uh, samples, it seems to just uh, take a sample at a spot and uh, go with it. It doesn't do seem to be doing any kind of averaging at all. So if your time base is too wide, we're at half a millisecond per division here. You see, we get this weird kind of uh, aliased, uh, non-waveform going. And if we can even zoom even further out, it kind of just keeps going. So you, one could easily be fooled to believe that this is the actual waveform we've got at, what, 412 hertz, where what we're actually measuring is a waveform at 100 kilohertz. Which we get there. So that, that again is a relatively major issue with this thing. And uh, if we compare it to the Rigol, which is set to the half a millisecond per division we were having earlier, it, it's doing it properly, it's displaying that you're obviously out of range instead of just <laughs> pretending to show you something it doesn't actually have. It should also be noted that it uh, b does begin to roll off uh, before even reaching 100 kilohertz because now we're measuring 4.83 volts RMS where we're still measuring about 6 in reality. Let's just step that down a bit and see where we actually start to roll off 60 kilohertz 50, 40, 30, 20, 10 yeah we're, we're basically starting to roll off after 10 kilohertz so <laughs> that's not too good, not too good at all I mean my multimeter's got a wider frequency response from this thing no good, especially not for an advertised 200 kilohertz scope the good thing about this scope though seems to be that as long as you actually stay within its capability which uh, I would reckon to be any audio frequency signal uh, between you know 0 to 20 kilohertz I would say that it actually performs quite admirably you can see it uh, compared to 
Veraigal over there. And as far as the general waveform presentation is concerned, it's doing a very good job. The presentation is just generally on par with a rigel, if, if as long as you don't look too far into it. The general gist you'll get out of a signal is going to be relatively correct. Even on a horrible arbitrary signal like this, it really doesn't do too bad of a job as long as you set the trigger up properly. And as for the noise performance of this 12-bit uh, ADC, well, it's actually not too bad. You know, it's measuring a 1.25 millivolt signal right now, and uh, it's performing pretty much on par with a Rigel, I'd say. The Rigel, of course, being a proper 8-bit scope. The biggest difference uh, you notice in this is that the Rigel uh, has the ability to re reveal a lot more high-frequency noise than the DSO-138 as you can see by the thickness of a Rigel's trace. And if we enable a 120kHz uh, low-pass filter on the Rigel, uh, which is somewhat similar to the analog bandwidth of this thing, even moving up a bit, uh, we can see that we get pretty much the same trace on both scopes. Although, of course, the lowest uh, vertical resolution you can get on the DSO-138 is uh, 10 millivolts per division, whereas on the Rigel you can get 2. So again, with a Rigel you can get a, a quite significantly higher resolution. But uh, there's a couple of models of magnitude price difference between between the two as well, so I'm definitely not uh, going to complain about the uh, low signal uh, performance of this thing. It's performing very admirably. Although when it comes to seeing repetitive analog signals through the noise, it's difficult not to appreciate the smoothness of an analog CRT. And the DC voltage accuracy is... I'd say good enough. I think this, imp this input is rated for 50 volts. So curiously you can measure up to, seems like, before 50 volts, but uh, you can't get the trace there. Because you've only got about, you've only got a 50 volt span on this thing, so <laughs> you would have to move the, the waveform all the way to the bottom to actually measure plus 50 volts and all all the way to the top to measure minus 50 volts so that's a bit weird although we are almost spot on accurate even in this mode when we're at the low range so that's a nice touch I mean it's not, not a reference by any means but it does decent DC voltage you could probably improve the absolute accuracy by tweaking some resistors because I noticed when I mounted it that uh, quite a lot of the resistors were right at the ends of the tolerance values. So I could imagine this thing not uh, being entirely unworthy of actually having some slightly better resistors installed, although this inaccuracy could be due to uh, just poor calibration of the ADC in the process. And I, I'm not certain what you could possibly do about that. Although for those of you with hacky inclinations, they do advertise that you can program the scope yourself and you'd get uh, uh, probably full connectivity to the microprocessor with both some kind of programming have a serial port and a USB interface. And there you have it, the DSO138 oscilloscope kit. I got this one donated to me for 2350 including shipping of a Banggood, but I don't think these are uh, actually are an authorised distributor. You can find a few more on the official website for the manufacturer. So would I recommend this thing to anyone? Well, I, I really can't fault it for too much for being a $20 class instrument. Uh, it, as a kit, it uh, really works quite well. The documentation is excellent, and uh, it's easy. It will come together easily. The parts you get are pretty cheap, generic Chinese, but you can replace those if you wish to. And the performance, 
I don't have a 200 kHz signal generator, but uh, just by using my 100 kHz generator, I, I'm pretty certain that this thing is not going to perform well at all at anything about audio frequency. So, if you want to do anything beyond uh, really basic stuff like uh, low frequency LED dimming or perhaps some kind of motor drive stuff or uh, audio amplifier troubleshooting, basic audio amplifier troubleshooting that doesn't involve trying to measure distortion, then I would say that this thing is a quite reasonable option if you really are that strong for money. Yeah, I, I could have seen myself using one of these a few years ago, back when I was in school, so if you think this will suit your application, go for it. Uh, for the price, I don't think you can do much better. And um, that's about all I've got to say about this. Uh, if you have any comments or any measurement you'd wish me to perform this thing or any test which I haven't included in this video, leave a comment and I might uh, respond and I will respond to it. And uh, if it's interesting enough, I might make a follow-up video. In the meantime, thank you for watching. Cheerio.